Well, good morning, beloved ones. It's always good to see you all and to, I thank you for being here this morning too, to remember, you know, on a holiday people travel and all kinds of things and prepare, but I'm glad that you uh, remembered to come and bless us with your presence on this wonderful Memorial Day. Well, it's actually tomorrow. And as Richard said, we're celebrating Memorial Day tomorrow, and it's really a time to remember those who have died in war in a battle of some sort, which is paying the ultimate price of service for our country and our nation. And so it began, I think, back, and I think I looked at the thing, it said 1930 when we began to start celebrating Memorial Day and honoring those who have perished in war. And then later, it morphed, the holiday morphed into remembering those of our family members who have perished or, de or, or deceased. And um, we used to go, I don't know if you're old enough, some of you are, I know, that when we used to go to the cemetery on Memorial Day, and um, we would put flowers on the graves of our loved ones. And I don't know if people do that today or not, or maybe they feel it's too morbid, but that's just, that was an, an occasion of which we would celebrate and, and honor those and remember those in our family. And then somewhere along the line, it morphed again into, as Richard said, the start of what? Of summer. So now when we think of Memorial Day, it becomes the start of summer, of holiday fun, of barbecues, of get-togethers and gathering with friends and family. And somehow the dead are now forgotten. And, or maybe if they're not forgotten, there's a passing remembrance of it all. And I began to think yesterday about, well, what is a memorial, you know? And whenever I, a word gets stuck in my head, I like to go to Daniel Webster, because I, I like to wordsmith words. And so I, I looked up memorial, and it says, a memorial serves to preserve remembrance. Or it is something that keeps remembrance alive. It keeps remembrance alive. And then that got me to thinking that, well, you know what? We all have a built-in memorial mechanism. We have a built-in memorial mechanism, namely our mind, our mind. Because Lord knows the mind, right? We remember all the things that maybe we would not want to remember, but, you know, with things that we want to hold on to, our minds seem to hold on to those things that we would even rather forget, but it holds on to it. And likewise, the mind also remembers and loves to hold on to those things that we want to remember, the good old days, the good times, right? So we remember the good times and we're holding on to the not-so-good times because we have this what we call, I call the memorial mechanism built into the mind to hold on and to remember. In fact, it's very fascinating that every thought that we have ever thought, every feeling we've ever felt, every perception, every opinion, every perspective, all of the, every idea that we have held in our mind is stored within an aspect of our mind. It's all there, all of it. Nothing is ever lost in mind. Now, sometimes I think my thoughts get lost in my mind and I can't find them and pull them up when I need them. But they're there nonetheless because it doesn't go away. Nothing is lost. And the thing is, we may not consciously remember every single thought that we have ever thought, but it is there in the subconscious phase of our mind. It never goes away. Now, I felt like just doing a little metaphysical teaching this morning. So there are three phases of our mind. There's more, but I'm going to focus on these three. Three phases of our mind or of our consciousness. We have the superconscious phase of mind. And the superconscious phase of mind is that realm of higher thoughts. 
that realm of spiritual insights, of, of revelations. It's that, that realm of divine knowing. It's not a thinking realm, it's a knowing realm, the intuitive aha from higher thoughts. Those come from the superconscious phase of our mind. And then we have the conscious phase. I call it our everyday mind. It's every day, the, that aspect of mind that we're thinking, we're choosing, we're analyzing, we're judging, we're assessing, we're deciphering, right? We're opinionating, we're doing all that stuff that you're doing right now. We're listening, categorizing, like it, don't like it, true, not true. All of that takes place in the conscious phase of mind. And then the third phase, of course, is the subconscious. Subconscious, and some people call it the unconscious. But the subconscious phase of mind simply stores everything. It stores it all. It's what I call, it's our memory bank. It's the memory bank of our mind. Because here's the thing, we simply can't hold or keep everything in the conscious mind. Didn't, I forgot what I did yesterday. I have to pull it up, right? I can't keep every, you can't keep every little thing conscious. It's hard to do. So it moves into the subconscious. We can't keep everything in that conscious mind, so we have to bank it. We bank it in our memory system. Now the challenge or the problem is, is that our memory system doesn't filter anything. It doesn't filter what we put into the memory bank. It just receives it all, right? It receives it all, that means it stores it all, the good, the bad, the ugly, the wanted, the not wanted, the true, the untrue, all of it. And when it's stored in there, what happens sometimes is it will begin to play itself out. All that's in there sometimes plays itself out and it will play itself out or pop up very often when we least want it to or we least expect it to. Somehow we get triggered. Something in the conscious realm triggers us and it pulls and goes down and digs up and gets an experience from the subconscious. Well, here, look at this. Well, how about this? You see? And, and all of a sudden now, these old feelings and old thoughts are right here present and now they've made themselves conscious to us because we've been triggered. Which is why we really want to become more conscious of what it is we're thinking, more conscious of what it is that we are feeling at the moment we're thinking it and feeling it. Because it will become a part of our memory bank eventually, right? So, so we want to be conscious of what it is, and more than likely, if I'm not conscious, it's going to show up when I least want it. Garbage in, garbage out. That's just the way that it works. So here's the thing, we can fashion our minds. We can fashion our minds and therefore we can fashion our memories as well. By being aware of the qualities of the thought that you are holding in your conscious mind, being aware of the perceptions and the judgments and all that, the conclusions you've come to, the opinion. See, we don't analyze, we just think a thought and hold on to it, yeah. Not recognizing that we are actually creating a memory, storing that energy, storing that thought into the memory bank. And here's the thing, once a thought becomes a memory, once it is stored in that subconscious mind, it then becomes harder to access whether it's even true or not, right? It becomes harder because now that, that thought, that feeling, that vibration just becomes a part, it's now a part of you. And it becomes harder to combat false, the false narrative, the false energy. You didn't decipher whether this was a true thought or whatever, but now it's harder because it's a memory. Now it's harder because it's, it's a part of you. It's harder to change. And you'll end up saying, well, I don't know, this is just the way I am. No, it's just the way you have thought. It's just the way you felt. It's just the way you perceived for a while. 
until it moved into a facet of your being. And now it's a part of you. It doesn't have to be you, but it is a what? A part of you. And so now it's harder to unearth that, right? Because now we're like, oh, we've got all this energy behind it, and it's harder to just change that. So the place that you want, the place and the time that you want to catch unwanted thoughts and perceptions and feelings is when they first enter your mind. Before they have an opportunity or the time to sink into the subconscious. Now I'll say this, every thought does go into the subconscious, but the deeper it goes is over time. When you put a little energy, when you combine the energy to that thought, then it goes down deeper. So every thought is recorded, but the depth of that thought has to do with whether you put some feeling energy to it. Now it, it really attaches. Now it's like, hmm, right? It's crystallized, it's really there in your mind. And so as we've got to think, when it first comes in, and now, because you're a metaphysician, and as a metaphysician, you need to check your mind constantly. You have got to check your mind, because when you're unconscious about what is in your conscious mind, it will move into the subconscious and affect your life. So we've got to just become more conscious. So as a metaphysician, you want to ask yourself, is this true? When you have that thought, and especially if there's some energy behind that thought, when there's a reaction, an emotion, you, is this true? Is this the kind of thought that I want to become a part of my memory system, my memory bank. Is this perception, is this judgment, is this perspective that I'm holding one that I want to linger around and impact my life, even when I expect it or don't expect it? Does this thought free me up or does it bind me? Is this thought freeing me or binding me to a limiting situation, a limiting circumstance? Am I, does it helping me to get stuck further into myself? Does this thought, is this thought speaking to the truth of my being? Is it speaking to the truth of my spiritual nature? Is it coming from my superconscious or is it coming from my conscious mind? See, the conscious mind has a whole bunch of stuff in it, right? And so where is this coming? Where is this thought coming from? To be able to train yourself to stop because you know a high thought when you, when you have one. And you know a low thought when you have one. And sometimes that low thought carries an energy of like maybe anger or whatever that kind of feels good and so you keep going down that path. Right? Because we have them. I'm mad and I'm right. I'm going to be mad. Okay. You can have that, but just know that that being mad and de deciding you want to remain in that anger, what you are doing is digging that thought, that vibration deeper into the part of your being, where it then becomes harder for you to open the heart and be light, open the heart and be love, because you've got a bunch of anger stuck down there. And so we have to look, wow, what is this thought? What's the quality? Where is it coming from? Is this a new thought even? Ask, is this a new thought? Or is it the same old thought that carries no new energy? Right? Now, we've had those thoughts too. There's no vitality to the thought. It's just a, 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 a thought that I'm repeating. I keep resending it. So I, is this a new thought that I'm having? Or is it, that's why we call ourselves new thought. But is this a new thought or is this an old, the same old thought that carries no energy, but it's just a memory taking up space in my consciousness? Calling me out constantly. And we got a whole bunch of stuff just taking up space that is not serving you well. It is not serving your spirit. It's not serving your physical being. Because if you have a whole bunch of limited negative thoughts that you are holding in your consciousness, rest assured, eventually it's going to come out in your body. It's going to come out in your affairs, in your relationships. It's got to come out some kind of way. So if it's not serving you well, 
we need to stop and think, is this a new thought? If there's no new energy, what is it that I need to change then? What do I need to do? Do I need to add some new energy or add some truth to this thought? Or maybe I need to see it differently. Or maybe I need to add some new flavor to the same old thought. Add some new flavor. If you keep thinking the same thing, having the same experience, it's time for some, get some seasoning sauce, add something new. <laughs> Have something new for it, right? See, the beauty of our mind is that it is a tool. It's a tool that we can use. And we forget that. We can use this tool to create a new experience. We can use this tool to even change the inner landscape of what's going on in our inner world and in our mind. We can even use this tool to create this, with these old memories, we can use it to create a new image, a new story, a new narrative, a new perspective, and we can make that old memory into a new memory by changing it. You talked about transfiguration, right? Changing the mind, changing that, that thought so that you now create, think a new thing and create a new memory so that what's down in the subconscious has a little bit more substance to help you in your ongoing and in your life. So the question might be for you to ask is where do you need to see yourself differently? I, I, this morning I was asking myself, and I came up with a couple places, I need to see myself differently because I'm seeing myself, the way I'm seeing myself is not the way I want to be. So I said, I need, to, I need a new thought. I need some new energy and new vibration to move me out of this old vibration and old image of myself. Because how I see myself is how I'm going to be experiencing myself and the world. So, you know, how do you see yourself differently? Because you can hold a vision in your mind's eye. That's one of our 12 powers, the gift of imagination, to be able to see a new image. And we know the image, we're created in the image and after the likeness of God. Can you hold that? What about that as an image? So, so you know, how do you need to see yourself differently? Hold it in your mind's eye and let it begin now to gather some spiritual substance. The holding of that vision for yourself, for the situation, is what it, it's the holding. This is what the law of mind action is about. When you hold it, thoughts held in what? Mind produce what? After their kind. When you hold that, you hold that thought and you couple that thought with the vision, ooh, that's the power of manifestation. Holding it and creating something new. Because see, when we forget that the mind is the tool, our mind is actually a tool that we can use to transform, to change, to create, to transfigure, right? To create the life that we wish and want to experience, then, then things begin to happen for us. But when we forget, when we forget to actually see what we want and hold what we want uh, and couple that with our things, then all of a sudden we, 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 we uh, waste the capacity of the mind's power. Scientists would tell you the mind is a very powerful, powerful tool. And when we don't use it, we waste it. And when we let the thoughts and the visions and the, uh, to just run around willy-nilly, we get willy-nilly. We get stuff and we're like, well, how'd that, where'd that come from? How did that show up? Why is that here? Because you weren't conscious and attentive to what's going on in your inner landscape, in your mind, in your presence. The Bible tells us that we ought to call a thing that is not as though it were, right? That is, speak it, and, and, and when you speak it and see it, then you have manifestation. You have transformation, you have change. So we've gotta learn how to use the mind, use your mind. Because, see, the subconscious uses you. But when you remember to awaken your conscious mind, you can affect the subconscious. When you remember to put some new thoughts in there, some new vision, some new ideas. This is why we affirm in, in new thought. We do denials and affirmations. See yourself, affirm that truth. 
And somebody said, well, you're just convincing yourself and you're just playing around with the mind. So be it. I'm creating a transformation. I'm using the actual activity of how the mind works to change my situation and my circumstance. So I, I, I'm learning to look at the quality of my thoughts, especially when I'm in some you know, negative state. So we've got to look at how are we using all phases of our mind. The subconscious mind just does. It just, you know, it's, it's hard. It just uses us. It just reacts. It just spews out. But the conscious mind and the superconscious mind, they're worker bees. And the main worker bee, the queen maker bee, is the superconscious mind. Because that's the mind of the divine. That's the mind of God in you. That's the mind of the uh, of spiritual realm, high thoughts, powerful thoughts, transformative thoughts, spiritual ideas. And Mr. Fillmore, you said a spiritual idea is the most powerful thing you can get. Because if you get a spiritual idea, a divine idea, then you've got something. Because divine ideas are eternal. They are, they are powerful. They can be recreated over and over and over again. An idea is powerful. But we've got to figure out which ideas are we repeating over and over and over. A divine one or one from a lower vibration and a lower consciousness. So when we use our superconscious mind, when we use, that's your Christ mind, that's your spiritual mind, which is why I'm always telling you, pray, meditate, pray, meditate, affirm, because you're accessing that superconscious mind. The more you pray, the more you meditate, you open up, you're opening you, yourself up to have the intuitive thought where you don't have to think a thing. But God's thought begins to download into your consciousness. You make yourself available, and all of a sudden you have higher insights. You'll know what to do. you know where to go without you thinking about where should I go and what should I do. Sit down, be still, and open up yourself to the superconscious mind. <clears throat> and that superconscious mind directs you. I was working on my talk this morning and I, I got a download and I, I, at about six in the morning I text Cheryl, I download, I was working on this experience, so I want you to use the uh, 30 days, what was it, at first it said a seven day mental diet for your class on Wednesday. And I'm working on this talk, but that's what came through and I'm like, what? So then I, I text her because I didn't want to call her at six in the morning. <laughs> and I didn't have time to go down into my library to think, where's that book, do I have it, I have it, but I got a download. Now, I don't know what it's about yet because I said, Cheryl, bring that book to, to, to me. And I said to Cynthia, go find that book in the library. Somebody get me that book. Because I've been guided, right? I got a download. Now, I don't know what's in it, but I'm sure there's something in it because the Spirit gave it to me. We've all had those moments, have we not? Yes. yes. But we want to be able to live in that consciousness, live in that vibration of the superconscious mind because it is our direct connection to divine mind. It's our sense of freedom. Now, if we can have this awareness and this consciousness, if we can give ourselves over to this consciousness, to the superconscious mind, it will begin to take care of everything. And what will happen is we will begin to remind ourselves, to remind ourselves of our original memory as divine creations. We will remind ourselves as, as, as to our true nature and the true power and the abilities that we have. And so the more we turn to this superconscious phase of our mind and aspects, then the more our memories will begin to serve us well because they'll be divine memories, right? Your mind is a tool. Use it because when we forget that, then all of a sudden we get caught up in the effects of the mind. See, the mind produces stuff. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. Your mind is going to produce stuff. Now, what it produces is up to you. It can produce some good, powerful stuff, and it can produce some stuff, right? Some stuff, right? Stuff that we don't want, we want to get rid of. Stuff that's not serving us well. So we have to then begin to remind ourselves. When I say remind, I'm talking about reminding, reworking, repurposing your mind. To remind yourself that you are the cause and not the effect. See, what happens, once you produce it, you enter effect. 
And we don't want to live at the realm of the effects of life. Right? You want to live at the realm of the cause of life. Because the effects get messy. So we want to train ourselves to live, to repurpose this mind and remind ourselves, I want, I want, I'm living at the cause, not the effect. I am the cause of life, not the effect. See, when you remind yourself, you're bringing the mind back to the truth. You're bringing the mind back to your original purpose. You're bringing your mind back to your desire. You're bringing your mind back to the fact that you can actually control your mind when you remind yourself of this truth. And I want you to know that there is a slight difference between remembrance and reminding. Remembrance and rem when you remember, you're bringing that thought back into your member. You're remembering it. You're bringing it back into the member, which means you're bringing it back into your being. That's fine. But when you are reminding yourself, what you are doing is you are transforming your mind. You're reminding it, reworking the mind, right? and reworking your consciousness. Now don't get me wrong because there's nothing wrong with the fundamental aspect of remembrance. It's a lovely thing to do. But when whatever it is you are remembering is not serving you well, or it is bringing you back into pain, back into emotional upheaval, back into confusion, back into limiting thoughts, well then you need to do some reminding reworking, not remembering, because the remembering aspect is not serving you. The reminding of your mind will help you to repurpose your mind to the creative aspect of your mind. See, the mind is not just a container of thoughts that hold thoughts. It is a creator of experience. Yeah, I started that when I wrote that. I said, ooh, that's good. Isn't that good? You know, that doesn't come from me. Sometimes I write it and I'm like, ooh, okay, spirit. Your mind is not just a container that holds all your thoughts. It is a creator of experience. There's a big difference. And so you want to remember, let me use this tool to create my experience. Let me see if I can use my superconscious mind, my divine mind, to cause a new effect. I want to cause a new effect in my life, a new experience, a new, a new uh, uh, thought. See, you are the master of your mind. And we are called, all of us, to live at the level of cause, not effect. And when we have produced something that is not quite ideal, and life does it as well because we're all in, in, entangled in race consciousness, so sometimes it's, it's what we've produced and sometimes what, what we as a collective have produced. That's all right, whatever is showing up, whether it's individual production or collective production, when it is not what we see, then we have to figure out what we want to do. We need to remind ourselves, get back to that which is the truth of our being. And we have to change this wonderful narrative, the inner narrative, change the story, right? Repurpose the mind. This is what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. When you repurpose, bring it back around, get it back to the truth, transformation and transfiguration happens. It's what will set you free. The truth will set you free. Mere remembering may keep you stuck in the past. But reminding, realigning, repurposing your mind can keep you in the present. You know, keep you in the present. And when you are in, the, because the present is actually the only place that can affect your past and your future. Whatever you're doing in the present moment, right here, right now, is going to eventually become your past, a past memory, whatever you're doing, and whatever you're doing in the present moment will also have a part of what takes place in the future. So the most powerful place is the present. That's where you get to control your past and your future, by being present, being awake, 
being alert, being clear, being the, 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 the guard at the gate. Guard this gate, finding what comes in and what goes out and being diligent, keeping your mind in the superconscious phase of mind, higher thoughts, higher purpose, higher consciousness, spiritual realm, accessing all that is good, elevating, meditating. This is the secret to creating the life that you want. I read this morning, I saw where the young lady who was uh, lost in the uh, forest in Hawaii, you all know about her, she was lost in the fire for 17 days. And I read a little blurb from her, she said, it came down to a matter of life and death. And she said, I chose life. You understand? So she was going, she was going, she said she ate berries, she chose life. She repurposed her mind and her situation in a forest for 17 days, but she chose life. And because of that choice, that conscious reworking of her mind, not, oh, I'm going to die. She said she thought about it. She said, oh, I'm at a point of life and death. I had the thought I could really die out here. And she said, mm-mm. I'm going to choose life. And that one little sentence, that one little thought helped her to find the berries she needed. Go find a waterfall that she had water. She chose her experience. Do you understand how the powerful the mind is? So, so this is our wonderful gift. Be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. It's a tool. Use it. Blessings and namaste. Namaste. Blessings. Blessings. Thank you.